as of course are Senator those Betts. who are fortunate enough to consume our product. Senator Betts, thank you. It being 2 p.m., we do need to move to questions without notice. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Last week, Senator Payne attended a meeting with Mr. Morrison, Ms. Archer, and Mr. Frydenberg. Who made the request for this minister to attend this meeting, and when was that request made? Uh, the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McAllister for the question. I was already in the Prime Minister's office for a meeting on another matter, and I was asked to remain in the office. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Was the minister aware that Ms Archer had asked that the meeting be postponed? Minister. Uh, no. Um, thank you, Mr President. And uh, in response to Senator McAllister's question, uh, no, I was not specifically aware that uh, there had been a request for the meeting to be postponed. Uh, I was simply asked to remain in the Prime Minister's office where I had been for another meeting. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary question. Can the Minister confirm Ms Archer, in her own words, spent the first half of the conversation crying and apologising? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I'm not going to comment on a uh, um, private meeting between uh, Prime Minister and colleagues. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. How is the Liberal Nationals government responding to international developments in relation to the new COVID-19 variant of concern? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Smith, for your question. As we've seen in the media over the last over the last few days, Mr. President, a new strain of COVID-19 first detected in Southern Africa, known as the Omicron strain, has been declared a variant of concern by the World Health Organisation. The Omicron strain has a high number a high number of mutations within its spike protein. Three cases of the variant have been detected in Australia in passengers arriving to Sydney and to Darwin, Mr. President. 14 passengers from a Sydney flight from Southern Africa, including two infected, are in quarantine and the remaining passengers are isolating. One person at the Howard Springs quarantine facility has tested positive to the new Omicron COVID variant. Yesterday, the Minister for Health signed a biosecurity determination valid until 12 December, preventing people who have been in an Omicron high-risk country within 14 days from entering Australia, unless they are an Australian citizen, permanent Order. resident, immediate family member or of a citizen or are otherwise exempt, including crew diplomats and members of the Australian Defence Force. High-risk countries for this purpose are Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Seychelles, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Mr. President, during this period, flights from these countries will not be permitted. Australian citizens, permanent residents and immediate family members who have been in high-risk countries in the 14 days prior to their travel uh, will be permitted to return but be required to undertake quarantine of 14 days in a managed facility. Uh, Mr. President, the government has increased the smart travel advice level for these high-risk countries in Minister, Southern Africa Minister, to do not travel. Your time has expired. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How does Australia's vaccination rate compare to other countries? Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Smith, for your supplementary question. Mr. President, on both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. More than 92 per cent of the eligible population over 16 are now protected against COVID-19 with a first dose and more than 86 per cent with a second dose. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has the second lowest number of COVID cases per capita. The UK and the US have more than 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. 
For example, over 12 per cent of people in the United States and 11 per cent of people in the United Kingdom have had COVID. By contrast, 0.4 per cent of Australians have had COVID. It's estimated that our program of support for Australians has saved more than 30,000 lives, Mr President, an important Minister, number. your time has expired. Senator Smith, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How can Australians, con how can Australians continue to prepare as new strains of COVID-19 enter the country? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Smith. Very simple action that Australians can take. Get vaccinated. Vaccination continues to be our best defence against the virus. To provide even greater protection against COVID-19, Australians aged 18 and over who have received two doses of a vaccine at least six months ago are now eligible for a booster shot. This follows advice from Australia's vaccine experts, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, and approval from Australia's medicines regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The booster program, Mr President, will roll out directly to people living in residential aged care and disability homes uh, through inreach programs. Uh, and uh, as of uh, today, there's over 500 aged care facilities and quite a few disability sites that have already received those inreach programs. This makes Australia one of the first countries in the world to commence a whole of population booster program. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Liberal MP Bridget Archer said she spent the first half of her meeting with Mr. Morrison, Senator Payne, and Mr. Frydenberg crying and apologising, and that she requested that the meeting with Mr. Morrison be delayed. Was the Treasurer aware of Ms. Archer's request? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, look, I'm not aware. Uh, of the, uh, the details of conversations between the Treasurer uh, and Ms Archer in relation to that matter. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Ms Archer has said that she went to Treasurer Frydenberg's office expecting a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, but that instead he took her to the Prime Minister's office. Did Mr Morrison ask Mr Frydenberg to bring Ms Archer to his office or was it Mr. Frydenberg's idea to ambush Ms. Archer with a meeting she was not ready for? Uh, Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, again, I'm not aware of uh, conversations between the Prime Minister uh, and the Treasurer in relation to, uh, to such matters. And I would note it would not be unusual Order. for the Leader of the Liberal Party to, uh, to want to engage with uh, parliamentary members of the Liberal Party. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Former Liberal MP Julia Banks has said that when she crossed the floor, Order. Mr. Frydenberg and I quote, played good cop, trying to lure me and ambush me, showering praise on me, declaring we were very good friends while saying I had to meet with the PM. Was this good cop tactic conceived by Mr. Frydenberg, or was he directed by Mr. Morrison? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, um, uh, look, uh, I'm uh, aware Ms. Banks makes a number of media comments. Uh, I haven't seen uh, that particular detail of media comment. But in relation to uh, the consequences of crossing the floor, Mr. President, uh, I'm well aware of the difference uh, between the consequences of crossing the floor on this side, the Liberal and National Parties. Minister. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Keneally, on a point, point of, of order. order is direct relevance. The question was not about crossing the floor. It was about the meeting that occurred. There is no way this could be directly relevant to the question that was asked. Minister, I will bring you back to the question that was asked, um, but you have the call. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, Senator Keneally's uh, uh, question, uh, indeed, uh, did, it, did contain references uh, to quotes about uh, the consequences of crossing the floor. Uh, and, Mr. President, the point I was making in relation to the consequences of crossing the floor uh, is that on our side of the chamber, the Liberal and National parties, members and senators have a right to cross the floor. Yes, you would expect and anticipate uh, that party leaders would wish to discuss that uh, with uh, Liberal or National MPs, uh, but for those opposite, there is no such right. 
the only consequence there is that their party tosses them out if they cross the floor. That is a fundamental difference, and it's a difference of which we are all very proud Minister, on this side. Minister, order, order, Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the current situation in the Solomon Islands? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator McGrath uh, for his question. Australia is deeply concerned by the recent civil unrest in, uh, in Honiara. I can advise the Senate that following several days of protests uh, with some violence, there were no significant incidents overnight or this morning. Uh, we do continue to monitor the situation very closely, however, and to respond accordingly. We understand there have, regrettably, been four deaths during the unrest. A curfew remains in place in Honiara between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. daily. Australia continues to call for calm, an end to violence and for tensions to be resolved peacefully. Our focus is to support stability. We do not take sides in these differences, nor do we take a position on other countries' choices about their diplomatic relationships. Australia has responded as a close friend, neighbour and partner, following a request from the Solomon Islands government under our bilateral security treaty. This is our responsibility under the treaty and the right thing to do in support of our Pacific family. Australian personnel are there primarily to support the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force. Australian Federal Police are working with the RSIPF, along with Papua New Guinean personnel, to conduct community patrols to maintain security. The Australian Defence Force are supporting the RSIPF and the AFP. We acknowledge the professional work of the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force to bring the situation under control. Mr President, the Australian mission in Honiara is operational and all staff and families are safe. I have spoken to uh, the acting head of mission uh, again today. We again advise Australians to avoid protests, to monitor local media, to avoid areas affected by protests and roadblocks and to follow the advice of local authorities. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question? Thank you. Can the minister provide further detail on Australia's support to our friend and neighbour? Minister. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator McGrath and also thank Senator McGrath for his interest in, uh, in these matters in the Solomon Islands. Um, within 24 hours of the request for assistance from the Solomon Islands government, Australia had responded. The Royal Australian Air Force began flights in support of our response on 25 November. As of this morning, we had deployed 45 AFP, 76 ADF and 8 DFAT personnel, in addition to the Australian personnel already, of course, based in the Solomon Islands. HMAS Armidale is scheduled to arrive tomorrow. We are taking every precaution against the risk of COVID-19 transmission. One of the Royal Australian Air Force flights that landed in Honiara yesterday carried 1,280 rapid antigen test kits to ensure no risk is posed by our personnel or those of partners. Australia's support is to contribute to maintaining stability, enabling tensions to be resolved by the Solomon Islands people within their own system. Senator McGrath, a second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate on Australia's engagement with Pacific partners and others in our shared response? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. And in addition to Australia's own deployment, we are working closely with regional partners who are similarly committed to a stable Pacific. We welcome the participation of 37 members of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary who have deployed alongside Australian personnel. We are working with Fiji to mobilise a number of uh, RFMF personnel who are expected to arrive tomorrow. These efforts are also in response to requests from the Solomon Islands government. Australia is also in discussion with New Zealand about further cooperation. I have engaged with my counterparts across the Pacific, and Prime Minister Morrison and Minister Seselja have done the same. Australia continues to engage and work with our Pacific family and like-minded partners as the situation develops. We are strongly committed to peace, security and stability across our region. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to Senator Payne, the minister representing the Minister for Trade. Minister, countries in Southern Africa are grappling with the new Omicron COVID variant while also suffering low vaccination rates. Meanwhile, Australia is set to join World Trade Organization's ministerial meetings soon with the proposed intellectual property waiver on COVID-19 vaccines on the agenda, which would allow for mass vaccine production across the global south. 
The government has stated that rather than support the waiver proposed by India in South Africa, it would try to find a convergence with the opposing countries. Your government is making no effort to galvanize support for a strong waiver. Amnesty International has labeled Australia a passive bystander in light of this. Why is the government taking the coward's way out and refusing to join more than 60 countries to co-sponsor the vaccine waiver as proposed by India and South Africa? The minister representing the Minister for Trade, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Faruqi for her question. We have been uh, consistent in our approach uh, on the TRIPS waiver, but let me begin by saying, uh, Mr. President, that we are also very disappointed that the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference, the MC12, uh, has been postponed owing to uh, the occurrence of the Omicron COVID-19 variant. We've consistently said, Mr. President, that Australia will support a TRIPS waiver, and our position has not changed. A waiver can only be passed with the support of all 164 WTO members, and there is no proposal on the table right now that has the required level of support. Uh, we are, as I said, disappointed that the conference has been postponed, but we remain committed to delivering an ambitious and meaningful outcome on the waiver. We are working with other countries to find common ground on a solution that will ensure all countries can overcome any intellectual property barriers as they respond to COVID-19 or future pandemics. We are, I would note, Mr. President, committed to supplying up to 60 million vaccine doses to our region by the end of 2022, including a number of developing nations, a significant number, including 20 million vaccine doses that Australia has already committed to share with the Pacific and Southeast Asia by mid-2022, an additional 20 million doses from Australia's own supply to be shared by the end of 2022, and up to a further 20 million doses to be procured through a partnership with UNICEF also to be shared by the end of 2022. And, Mr President, we have already shared more than 9.2 million of these doses across our region as at the end of this month, including 4.6 million doses to Indonesia, 1.5 million to Vietnam, 1 million to Fiji. 700,000 to the Philippines delivered last week, almost 678,000 678, to Timor-Leste, over 200,000 to the Solomon Islands, over 200,000 to Papua New Guinea. We have committed $130 million to the COVAX Minister, Advanced Market Commitment as well. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question? Minister, Australia's donor funding to the global COVAX facility is low, very low by global standards. Australia is contributing only $4 per person, compared to nearly triple that by the United States, and many times less than countries such as Sweden and Norway. Why is Australia shunning the COVAX facility with such miserly contributions and failing to do its fair Order. share, helping the Global South countries get vaccinated? Do you Order. even care about global vaccine equity? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Caring about global vaccine equity, Mr. President, includes delivering. Delivering on the sorts of commitments that I made explicitly clear in response to Senator Faruqi's previous question. But in the absence of that having been heard at the other end of the chamber, Mr. President, let me reiterate it in very clear terms. We are committed to supplying up to 60 million vaccine doses to our region by the end of 2022. 20 million vaccine doses that we've already committed to share with the Pacific and Southeast Asia by mid next year, an additional 20 million doses from Australia's own supply to be shared by the end of next year, and up to a further 20 million doses to be procured through our funded partnership with UNICEF, also to be shared by the end of 2022. We have already shared over 9 million doses, Mr. President, across our region. 4.6 million to Indonesia, 1.5 million to Vietnam, 1 million to Fiji, 700,000 to the Philippines, 677,850 to Timor-Leste, 213,000 to Solomon Islands. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, a second supplementary question. Minister, last month the World Health Organization reported that just five African countries, less than 10 per cent of Africa's 54 nations, are projected to hit their 2021 target of fully vaccinating 40 per cent of their people. Not 2022, 2021, unless they said efforts to accelerate the pace take off. 
How many more people have to unnecessarily get sick and die from COVID in the Global South before Australia backs the strong TRIPS waiver and properly funds COVAX? Senator COVAX? Faroqi, your time has it. Minister. I will not have Australia misrepresented as not backing the TRIPS waiver because that is not true and you are spreading misinformation in doing that. I will not have Australia misrepresented in relation to our contribution to the international vaccine effort and most particularly in our region, Mr President, the Pacific and Southeast Asia, which is our backyard. And the contributions that we are making in those countries are changing lives and saving lives. Senator Gallagher. I thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. How many funds in the Morrison Joyce government's budget are allocated at the discretion of the minister, and what is their total value? Uh, the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I don't have those details uh, immediately to hand, as, uh, as I'm sure would not be of a surprise to Senator Gallagher. I'm happy to uh, to take. Uh, those details uh, on notice, so far as, uh, so far as we can uh, extract that information. As, uh, uh, as Senator Gallagher well knows, uh, the, uh, the administration uh, directly of funds uh, occurs across a range of portfolios. So the Department of Finance uh, operates the Commonwealth Grant Guidelines and, uh, and has a role in relation uh, to the approval of those grant guidelines, which are then administered across the relevant portfolio departments and by uh, different ministers, providing support uh, for a range of different services uh, right around the country. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Commonwealth grants have been used as vehicles, for example, during COVID-19 uh, to provide additional support uh, to early childhood education and care services, to provide uh, one particular uh, example, Mr. President, that comes to mind. Indeed, they've also been used as a vehicle uh, by Senator Colbeck uh, in this chamber to help provide additional targeted support to aged care facilities uh, around Australia. And so the grant guidelines are used for a range of different uh, functions and purposes in terms of supporting the delivery of Commonwealth assistance. Uh, yes, Mr. President, they often support, and I suspect uh, this will be where Senator Gallagher goes, a range of different local or community-related uh, projects, uh, and those projects uh, are done in accordance with those grant guidelines too. Uh, but uh, the types of uh, discretion that are provided, uh, the types of non-competitive processes that exist in place, uh, those types of processes are often there, Mr. President, to enable swift response by ministers in circumstances such as those uh, that I outlined before uh, in supporting uh, direct targeted assistance uh, to sectors that need it most at Order. different junctures, for example, those in aged care or early childhood during the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that over the eight long years of the Morrison Joyce government, ministers have allocated 71 per cent of $3.9 billion worth of taxpayers' funds in these discretionary grant funds to coalition seats? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, I, I can confirm that Senator Gallagher uh, is quoting from. Uh, what I understand to be an Australia Institute uh, study uh, that has selectively chosen, selectively chosen uh, a number, a very small number of Commonwealth grant programs uh, upon which to base its analysis, Mr. President. Uh, that's the figure that uh, that's where Senator Gallagher is drawing her figures from, uh, Mr. President. Uh, an Australia Institute survey. Uh, I imagine she's quoting probably from the report published in The Guardian of the Australia Institute survey. It's, it's quite a, a virtuous little cycle we've got going here that uh, the Australia Institute does the report, The Guardian publishes it, the Labor Party asks about it. But of course, it's all just selective reporting uh, when it comes to, uh, comes to these matters, Mr. President. Uh, the fact is that in selecting these targeted areas, there's a disproportionate capturing of regional grants, for example, where the coalition holds the vast majority of electorates, uh, Mr. President. So Minister, it would be a little surprise Minister, uh, that the Minister, regional program support. Minister, Minister, time has expired. Senator Gallagher, Thank you, a Mr. second President. supplementary. Can the minister explain why seats held by independents and that the coalition wanted to win back? have received an average of $206 per person. Coalition-held seats have received $184 per person, and safe Labor seats have received just $39 per person. Why are some Australians worth more than others to Mr Morrison? 
Minister. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I, I, I think I can give it a crack in terms of explaining, in relation to regional grants programs, why it is that coalition seats uh, have benefited overall when you take all electorates across the country more than Labor-held seats, or even why independents Order. might have benefited more. And that, Mr. President, would be the maths of the fact that the coalition holds more regional seats than does the Labor Party. And indeed, in terms of proportionality, the independents uh, have, uh, have greater representation in some of the regions than they do in some of the urban areas, Mr. President. Uh, so, in terms of distorted statistics and figures, Mr. President, which is what are being bowled up here, the simple reality uh, of these programs is: yes, they will support Liberal and National Party-held seats at a, to a greater degree because those communities have elected Liberal and National Party MPs across regional Australia across regional Australia, or in some cases they have elected independent MPs. That is simply a function of our Minister, parties holding those Minister. electorates. Senate order. Senator Hughes. Senator Roberts. Uh, a question. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In recent months, more than one million Australians have participated in freedom protests around our country, with many not wearing a mask, not socially distancing, and mostly being uninjected. Opportunities for person-to-person -person transmission of COVID runs into the tens of millions, which we're told is inviting mass outbreaks. Yet the only case I know of COVID transmission at a freedom rally was a cluster that occurred in the Melbourne rally, and that cluster was amongst Antifa anti-freedom protesters. Minister, in the last three months, how many COVID clusters, that's two or more infections, have occurred at freedom rallies? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Roberts, for the question. Um, Mr President, I don't think that there's been any attempts to attribute specific COVID infections to uh, any such public event of that nature, so uh, I don't have uh, and we don't hold the government doesn't hold data in relation to that. Uh, although it may be that some of that information is held at a state level where the contact tracing processes uh, for COVID-19 are conducted, Mr. President. Uh, but can I go back to something that I've put to the chamber on a number of occasions? Uh, the whole point of where the government is going in relation to the vaccination program is to get as many Australians as possible to be vaccinated. We know the vaccine works. We know that it's safe. and We know that it supports ourselves in protecting us from COVID-19. We know that it protects our families and we know that it protects our communities. Uh, and one of the really fortunate things that we've seen in this country is the willingness of Australians to go out and get vaccinated. In excess of 92 per cent of Australians have now had a first dose. In excess of 86 per cent of Australians have now had a second dose. It's one of the reasons that um, we are able to start to reopen our economy, uh, to reopen our communities, which is what I think the people who are uh, participating in these protests are looking for. They want to see uh, us be able to get around uh, more freely. Uh, and the discipline the decision to take up a vaccine, which we know is safe, we know that works, is really important, Mr. President. And we continue to monitor circumstances globally, as I said in my uh, answer to the question uh, earlier in question time to Senator Smith, so that we can understand what's happening with new variants. We can take appropriate actions to protect Australians from those new variants while we learn more about them, get to understand the impact that uh, the vaccines might have on those new variants, uh, so that we can keep Australians safe. And we will continue to take all of the actions that we need to do Minister, to do just that. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. A European study found the death rate per 100,000 of double vaccinated subjects averaged 2.5 per month, with the uninject, un uninjected rate lower at 1.1. The government has authorised the third booster shot, so must have modelled death rates against overseas experience and have an anticipated outcome from your booster program. Minister, what is the anticipated death rate for triple vaccinated Australians as compared to unvaccinated Australians? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the things that we've seen here in Australia uh, and around the world, and one of the things that we've been concerned about as the pandemic has continued to 
progress is the impact on, un on the unvaccinated of the virus. Uh, the, I, I, I know that when I was in Japan earlier in the year, the reporting out of the US uh, that I saw on a daily basis was that in the United States it was becoming very much a, a, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Somewhere between 90 and 95 per cent of those in hospital uh, suffering severe symptoms of COVID-19 were actually unvaccinated. Some figures out of New South Wales earlier this year indicated that uh, similar proportions, 90 to 95 per cent of those in hospital with severe illness, uh, severe symptoms of the virus were actually unvaccinated, Mr. President. The data is very clear. The data is very clear. Uh, and it shows up in the circumstances of the most vulnerable in this country that the vaccine works. Minister, Minister, your time has expired. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary. The South African Health Minister said on Sky News that the scientists who isolated Omicron never said it would be vaccine resistant. Angelique Coetzee, the South African Medical Association chair, stated on Fox, symptoms are so mild we don't know why so much hype is being driven. Yet Australian media have dialed fear to the maximum, freedoms are again being removed and big pharma are raking in billions from boosters. Minister, will the death of the Liberal Party be counted as a COVID death or as self-inflicted? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I suspect a party as proud as the Liberal Party will probably be around for a fair while longer than Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. So, Mr. President, and, and, I, and I look forward to that, Mr. President. But can I say, um, I do agree with Senator Roberts with respect to uh, we, we need to take the time, take the moment to understand the circumstances of this new variant. Um, that's why the government has taken the proportionate measures that it has done to ensure that we have the time to understand uh, what the impact of this variant might be with respect to vaccination, uh, with respect to transmission, with respect to the seriousness of its impact on the communities uh, before we continue the processes that we'd undertaken with respect to opening up. That's why we took the appropriate precautionary response at the weekend to say seven nations, uh, sorry, nine nations will, will cease uh, access to Australia. Uh, so Minister, we need to Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General please outline to the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is unmasking and tackling online trolls to protect everyday Australians from harassment and abuse online. The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Henderson for the question. And I do acknowledge her keen interest uh, in this particular area. And, Mr. President, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, we know that social media has, for far too long, allowed trolls, bots, and bigots to weaponise anonymity to strike out at ordinary Australians. Uh, that is just unacceptable behaviour. And that is why the Morrison-Joyce government will introduce new laws which are capable of forcing global social media giants to unmask anonymous online trolls and at the same time better protect Australians when they are online. This is a world first legislation, Mr President, and we will address these pressing issues of online abuse and defamation liability. The legislation which will go to exposure draft this week will do the following. In the first instance, provide certainty flowing from the High Court's decision in Fairfax Media and Voller, and we will clarify who is a publisher of defamatory comments on social media, and that will be the social media company themselves. We will also protect Australian social media users from potential liability for comments made by online trolls. We will support Australians who are the subject of defamatory comments on social media to unmask anonymous online trolls, and we will assist Australians to institute defamation proceedings in state and territory courts. We will deem, as I said, the social media providers to be a publisher of defamatory comments on their platform in circumstances where the online troll cannot be identified. Again, Mr President, this is all about protecting ordinary Australians from liability for comments made by third-party users on social media. It is also about ensuring that anyone who operates in the online space is operating in a safe space. 
Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Why is it important for the government to take strong action against online trolls and ensure social media companies are helping to ensure online safety? The Minister Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And we know social media use, it is increasing, and it's increasing in Australia. But what that increase in the utilisation of social media has done is bring greater exposure to online harms, and that includes exposure to defamation. We know that social media can amplify the harmful defamatory impact of material posted by online trolls. This includes the use of algorithms, which can push harmful material to users far more quickly than was possible through traditional media. At this point in time, victims have limited to no recourse against the anonymous originators of defamatory comments made on social media. What we will do is we will provide new pathways for victims to quickly and easily identify originators of defamatory material posted on social media. Again, this is world leading in terms of what Australia is doing to ensure that when you are online, you're in a safe environment. Senator Henderson, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, with more Australians than ever using and benefiting from social media today, can you please outline what the government is doing about online harms more broadly? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And the Morrison Joyce government has been leading the way in protecting Australians online. When eSafety was established in 2015, it was the first agency in the world dedicated to protecting citizens from online dangers, such as cyberbullying targeted at children. Through the work of Minister Fletcher with the Online Safety Act and the eSafety Commissioner, we are bringing the rules of the real world to the online world. And this, of course, includes the introduction of a complaints-based removal notice scheme for cyber abuse for adults based on the model that is in place for children. Our government has also recently released our online privacy code, working to protect our personal data and, in particular, our children's data and ensure that it is used appropriately. The government also acted quickly to protect Australians from the live streaming of terrorist content through the abhorrent violent material legislation. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that nearly two years after COVID-19 reached Australian shores and with the emergence of a new variant of concern, not one new federal quarantine facility has yet opened its doors? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, I thank the Senator uh, for her question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Australia's uh, decisions uh, taken and led by the Prime Minister from, uh, from the 1st of February last year to uh, close our international borders have been a key feature in terms of Australia's success uh, in protecting Australians from COVID-19, in ensuring that, uh, that we have uh, saved lives, uh, some estimated 30,000 plus lives compared with uh, the OECD averages in terms of deaths around the world. Uh, alongside that, we've been fortunate to be able, uh, thanks to economic responses, to be able to save businesses, to be able to save jobs, and uh, to be able to ensure that Australia weathers this global storm caused by this global pandemic. Minister, Minister. Well, yeah. on, the, on a point of order, Senator McCarthy. Uh, relevance, uh, I've asked specifically about the building of new quarantine facilities. Uh, I'm, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. Um, uh, the, I, I'll allow you to bring the minister back to the question. Minister, uh, you have the call. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Those, uh, those border closures uh, have served Australia well. The quarantine arrangements that, uh, that have been associated with uh, those border closures have also overwhelmingly worked effectively and served Australians well as well. In the vast majority of, Austra of cases, uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians have been able to, uh, to move uh, back into our country safely and securely. Uh, part of that, Mr President, has been uh, the crucial role that the Howard Springs facility uh, has played in the Northern Territory, uh, which received significant expansion to the 2,000 capacity uh, during this time frame. 
Mr. President, in addition to uh, the work of the Howard Springs facility, uh, work is underway on additional quarantine facilities uh, in Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. Uh, following uh, the encouragement uh, and Order. partnership agreements struck uh, by Order. state governments in each of those jurisdictions. Uh, the first of those is scheduled to uh, see beds handed over uh, to the Victorian government uh, by the end of this year. Uh, that remains on track and remains the case in terms of providing longer-term capabilities to respond to uh, COVID or other emergencies into the future. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Would Australia's defences against the Omicron variant be stronger if Mr Morrison had listened to the experts and built fit-for-purpose national health Order. quarantine? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, Australia's defences uh, throughout COVID-19, as I said at the outset, have been incredibly strong. We've shown amazing resilience as a nation and we've shown great capacity to be able uh, to minimise uh, the loss of life and, whilst minimising the loss of life, to work ourselves into a position as a nation where we are now one of the most heavily vaccinated and most protected populations and nations across the planet. Uh, and that, Mr President, is our key protection in relation to COVID-19. Uh, we are working on building these additional centres for national resilience. Uh, these centres will serve the purpose uh, in, in continued response uh, to COVID-19, but also Mr. President, they will serve Keneally. the purpose in response to other future uh, pandemics, natural disasters or emergency situations uh, around the world. It is important in relation to the Omicron variant that we do keep a sense of perspective, as many infectious disease and public health experts have urged, and the government is working Minister. through the evidence in relation to that. Senator McCarthy, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How many more variants of concern will appear on Australian shores before Mr. Morrison finally delivers fit for purpose national quarantine capacity? Minister. Oh. Mr. President, um, I think it is you know, very important for uh, all leaders in this place to keep a sense of perspective Senator in relation Keneally. to the Omicron variant uh, or indeed other variants that may emerge in the future. Uh, as Professor Peter Collignon, infectious diseases physician at the ANU, uh, said, uh, fear is out of proportion to the data at the moment with this new variant. Uh, and indeed, as Professor Greg Dorr, epidemiologist at the Kirby Institute, said, the ideal response to uncertainty is to accelerate evidence gathering. It's not to pull Order the panic levers. Left. Mr President, I would urge those opposite and all to keep that sense of perspective at present. Uh, the government has acted in a precautionary way to further tighten border restrictions in relation to a number of nations across uh, the southern part of the African continent. Uh, we are continuing Senator to receive Gallagher. regular briefings in relation to this, but it is notable that a number of health experts have highlighted uh, the seemingly mild implications of this variant, uh, and so we ought to all keep Minister. it in perspective. Senator Molan. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National, and, uh, uh, National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister update the Senate on what arrangements the Liberal and National Government has in place to ensure we are well prepared for bushfires, floods and other natural disasters this high-risk weather season? The Minister for Emergency Man Management, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Molan for his question and his long interest in emergency management matters. The Australian government is well prepared to respond to disasters that may occur during the upcoming high-risk weather season. We've been working closely with states and territories to ensure that all levels of government are ready to respond quickly and effectively. Since September this year, our government, through Emergency Management Australia, has led a national preparedness program with states and territories, industry and non-for-profit organisations so that we've practised our responses to crises. On 5 September, we announced additional funding to support preparedness for the upcoming season, including $2 million for the National Community Education and Engagement Program for the Australian Warning System due to commence this week, $4 million to the Australian Aerial Firefighting Centre to fund the lease of a large air tanker, 
uh, over $20 million to implement the Australian Fire Danger Rating System to give clear and consistent fire danger information across Australia, and $23 million to enhance EMA's National Situation Room to have the most up-to-date information to hand in a crisis. But we know that these severe weather events are inevitable, and that's why we're even better prepared to respond to disasters once they've happened. We've put in place a new streamlined process for activating the disaster recovery funding arrangements, and that's the primary way we fund recovery following disasters here in Australia. These arrangements are co-funded in partnerships with jurisdictions and delivered by state and territory who have actually requested that assistance. They provide much needed assistance for immediately after a natural disaster, but we're not just focused on immediate response and recovery, we're also focused on developing resilience because we know the money spent on building community resilience before a disaster will provide more long-term value than money spent on recovery. Our government's invested heavily in disaster risk reduction with the $600 million Preparing Australia program. And on the 8th of November, I announced the release of the grant opportunity guidelines for round Minister, one. Minister, and I look forward to applications. Has expired. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. With COVID restrictions still in place in some states and territories, and a new variant of concern, what has the Commonwealth government done to prepare for the movement of essential personnel during COVID-related border closures? Minister. Well, this year, the Australian government, through Emergency Management Australia, has worked with states and territories and industry to agree the COVID-19 interstate deployment protocol. The protocol will facilitate cross-border movement for emergency support specialists and technicians, not only for that immediate response uh, in the middle of a crisis, but for the all-important work associated with cleaning up and rebuilding after the disaster occurs. The updated protocol came into effect on 8 November. Uh, with endorsement from state territory emergency chiefs as well as the Australian Health Principal Protection Committee. It will mean we can ensure essential workers required to repair critical infrastructure assets like telecommunication, power, energy and health can go where they're needed to restore these essential services to Australians. It will also apply to tradespeople where rebuilding is required and insurers to make it easier for people to access the support they need to repair their homes and get their businesses back up and running after a disaster. Senator Molan, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, with the high-risk weather season in full force during the last few weeks, particularly in my state of New South Wales, can the minister please update the Senate on what support the government has provided to the communities recently affected by flooding across the country? Minister. Well, severe weather events like we've seen over New South Wales over the past week are always distressing for those uh, who experience them. And that's why our government is committed to supporting communities impacted by natural disasters. The recent severe weather event in New South Wales caused damage to critical infrastructure and residential properties while the very heavy rain has caused flooding to occur and damaging crops right across New South Wales. The Australian and New South Wales government-funded disaster assistance will provide a range of practical assistance measures to help councils, individuals, primary producers, small businesses and charities to recover and get back on their feet. The assistance will help cover the costs associated with the operational response and repairing damaged essential public assets. And additionally, individuals will receive support to get back on their feet, including grants to replace essential household contents or respect, repair structural damage to homes, because our government is ready to stand side by side by these communities as, and ensure that they recover. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In December 2018, Mr Morrison stood next to Mr Porter and announced he would deliver a National Integrity Commission. But more than a thousand days later, Mr Morrison has not introduced his own legislation and last week defied the House of Representatives, which demanded an anti-corruption commission. Why did Mr Morrison say he would create a National Integrity Commission when that just wasn't true? The Minister the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank, uh, thank the Senator for her question. Well, Mr President, uh, uh, indeed, she is correct. The government uh, did commit uh, to, uh, to uh, build and establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. 
Uh, we not only uh, committed to it, Mr. President, uh, but uh, we funded some $150 million in, uh, in budget proceedings for it. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have consulted on it. Correct, Senator Cash. We've consulted quite widely in relation to it. Consulted quite widely. Uh, released draft legislation uh, as part of Order that consultation, Mr. President. Uh, indeed, Senator we have uh, 349 Senator pages of legislation uh, to uh, to support the implementation of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, Mr. Order President. We released left. our bill, Mr. President, uh, with the full intentions that we would like to implement. Our bill, Mr. President. The problem, Mr. President, lies in the fact that those opposite won't and don't support our bill. That's the problem. They won't agree to pass the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that the government has worked to develop, has released legislation for, Order. has provided funding for. Those opposite aren't interested in a model that ensures integrity, Order. Mr. President. They aren't interested in a model that focuses on weeding out corrupt conduct, Mr. President. What those opposite want is, of course, to make sure it's as politicised as possible. That seems to be the desire of those opposite, because their whole campaign tactics are about smear and sledging at present. We see that time and time again in the questions they bring into this place, in the nature Minister, of their interviews, Minister, in the sensitivity with Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong, uh, on I just flag I leave that the le leader of the government can. We would give you leave to table your legislation here and Senator now, Wong, should you wish. We order. would give you leave. Senator Wong, Minister, you have the call. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. So, so those opposite not happy with our model, but. What's the alternative they've offered? Well, of course, they haven't actually provided a detailed alternative. All we can take is that they want. All we can take is that they want a vehicle for smear, uh, a vehicle for politicisation. But themselves, they only have a two-page glossy, two-page glossy, two pages compared Senator with Wong. the 349 pages Time. of legislation. Sorry. I could you please sit down, Senator O'Neill? Those on my left calling time whilst interjecting to the point where I was dealing with the chamber is not helping. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday, New South Wales Liberal Premier Dominic Perrottet said, and I quote, ICAC does a very important job. It gets rid of corruption from public life. Why does Mr Morrison disagree with Premier Perrottet? Uh, Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, we are very happy uh, to support a model for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission that is focused uh, on eliminating corrupt conduct. That is precisely what the legislation we have developed actually does, Mr President. What it does not do, though, is establish kangaroo court type proceedings that operate in ways to destroy reputations Order. even Mr President even Mr President when there is no finding let alone ultimate prosecution in relation to corrupt conduct Mr President that's where the line of distinction exists now in Senator Wong and my home state Mr President I know that there's been a different approach taken in relation uh, to the role uh, of ICACs. It's a model that works more closely analogous uh, to the one uh, that our government has released legislation for, uh, that operates in a way that doesn't seek to destroy reputations in advance. Order. So there are different models that exist. We have presented one. We invite those opposite to publicly indicate they would support the passage of our legislation. Minister, your time has expired. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. If only they were in government, yeah. So, Order. Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Last week, senators crossed the floor in defiance of Mr Morrison, and on Thursday, a member of Mr Morrison's own government crossed the floor in the House because of his ongoing refusal to act. Hasn't Mr Morrison completely lost control of the House, lost control of his senators, and lost control of his government. Minister. Mr President, the answer is no. The answer very clearly is no. Uh, but, 
Those opposite are entirely focused, entirely focused on internal political machinations because that's all they know. It's certainly all that their leader, Mr Albanese, knows. It's all Mr Albanese knows are the politics of smear and the politics inside this parliament. What you don't hear them asking questions about, what you don't hear them pursuing policies on, are the things that matter to Australians. Our government is clearly focused on the 700,000 jobs that we've recreated since COVID-19 struck at its deepest point. Our government is focused on the 133,000 apprenticeships that we have created as a result of our policies. Our government is focused on the delivery of tax cuts that are putting $1.5 billion Order a month back into the pockets of hardworking right. Australians, Mr President. We're focused on a $110 billion infrastructure program, on national security through the AUKUS partnership. They're the things we're focused on, Mr President, Minister, not the politics of smear Minister, like those opposite. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Minister Rustin. How is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting older Australians in their retirement? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Abetz uh, for his question. Well, this government is absolutely committed to finding new and innovative ways uh, to support aged pensioners and self-funded retirees in their retirement. And that's why we're in introducing legislation this week to ensure older Australians are supported to use their own resources to maximise their retirement outcomes. We're delivering on our 2021-22 budget measure, enhancing the pension loan scheme with a $21 million reform package. Um, it's important to point out that the pension loan scheme is available to all Australians who have reached age pension age, and that includes people who are part pensioners and people who are self-funded retirees. The program can be used for them to top up their retirement income by using some of the equity that they have in their home or other assets. Um, and when the so the ha their house is sold, the loan is then repaid from those proceeds. The loan amount is paid out fortnightly at the rate of up to 150 per cent of the, pension, of the full age pension. Under the budget reform, we are expanding the scheme through the introduction of lump sum payments. From the middle of next year, people using the pension loan scheme will be able to access up to two annual lump sum advances yeah. in any 12-month yeah. period, up to a total of 50 per cent of the maximum annual rate of the age pension. The popularity of the pension loan scheme has grown more than fivefold in less than two years as our expansions to the scheme have allowed more retirees to tap into the equity tied up in their homes to pay for additional living expenses. The School of Risk and Actuarial Studies at the University of New South Wales believe, the access, believe access to lump sum payments will increase the attractiveness of the scheme. We know that home ownership has always been the bedrock yeah, yeah. of our society, and we want to make sure that we give older Australians the confidence to tap into a small proportion of their home equity to make sure that their yeah. retirement outcomes yeah. are maximised for their own benefits. Yeah. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question? Yes, there is, Mr President. I thank the Minister for the wealth of information contained in her extensive answer. And can I ask the Minister um, for further advice, and that is, how has the government supported older Australians throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as we recover from the pandemic, some older Australians are facing new challenges and stresses, such as loneliness and increased social isolation. Be Connected, which is run, uh, runs um, the friend line, and it encourages older Australians who may be lonely and not having anyone to talk to, to call and have a chat to a volunteer. We know that there's a real need for assistance to alleviate loneliness and social isolation, so programs like Friendline are here to help. And I would encourage all senators in this place to make sure that you let your constituents know, particularly your older constituents, that this service is available to them uh, to make sure that they have someone to reach out to if they don't have a friend or family member to do so. Throughout the pandemic, we also made economic support payments to more than 2.5 million Australian age pensioners, who are among the 5.5 million Social Security recipients to receive one-off payments in 2020-21. These were paid at $750 Minister, in both March Minister, and July. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Abetz, a 
Second supplementary question. Yes, there is, Mr. President, and uh, I thank the minister again for another extensive uh, answer for which I thank her. Can the minister further update the Senate on how our Liberal National Government is providing pensioners flexibility in their retirement and tackling misinformation? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, our government is focused on ways we can make a real difference in the lives of aged pensioners. We want them to have flexibility to boost their income so that they can choose how they spend their money in retirement. We're doing this through changes to the pension loan scheme as well as the work bonus, which increases the amount a pensioner can earn from work before it affects their pension rate. This is in stark contrast to those opposite who are focused on frightening senior Australians with a false campaign. For the record, can I please repeat again in this place, the government has been very, very clear. The Morrison government has no plan and never will have a plan to force age pensioners onto the cashless debit card. Senior Australians know that we are the party that can be trusted to protect their interest in retirement, which is exactly what we will do and continue to focus on. We will not scare age pensioners for political gain. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Just give a few moments for senators to leave the chamber. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Payne and Senator Birmingham to the questions asked by Senator Keneally and myself. Well, last week, two members of the House of Representatives crossed the floor to vote against the government. One, the member for Dawson, voted against a government bill, and he delivered a speech that likened vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions to the Nazi regime and then um, thank you. he called for civil uh, disobedience. Senator yes, Senator Scum. Deputy President, there was absolutely no reference at all in either the question put by Senator McAllister or the question put uh, by the other senator from the other side to either George Christensen or his contribution last week, and there was no reference at all in the answers from Senator either Scar, minister with respect uh, to that question. Point. Thank you. Please resume your seat. Please continue, Senator McAllister. Order! Senator McAllister, please continue. Thank you, Deputy President. So one member crosses the floor under one set of circumstances, and the other member, the member for Braddon, voted to bring on a debate on an integrity commission after three years of inaction by the government. Only one of these members was hauled into the Prime Minister's office and reduced to tears. Sometimes the things that someone doesn't do can tell you as much about their character as the things that they do do. Last week in Senate Question Time, we learned that Mr Morrison didn't feel the need to speak to a member of the coalition whose comments in and out of the parliament had the capacity to incite violence. He simply wasn't interested. It wasn't important enough. Now the Prime Minister has some real questions to answer about why that's the case. But there is also a broader question. Why was Ms Archer treated so differently from Mr Christensen and forced to speak with the Prime Minister against her will? Well, two-thirds of Australian women regularly tell surveys that they don't believe they are treated equally at work. And those women may have an idea why Mr Morrison singled out Ms Archer for special attention. They are seeing a pattern that they know all too well, because Ms Archer now has the dubious honour of joining the list of Liberal women who have publicly spoken about the way the Prime Minister, his staff or close allies have used their power against them. The Prime Minister has described the meeting as a very warm, friendly and supportive meeting. Ms Archer has said it wasn't a pastoral care meeting and further that she spent the first half of the conversation crying and apologising. It doesn't sound like the same meeting, does it? The Prime Minister finds himself in a position where, yet again, someone has called his version of events inaccurate and misleading. 
But perhaps it's not shocking that the Prime Minister has a different story from the woman who was in the room. This is the Prime Minister who has never really explained how he came to be so surprised when he learned uh, the following things. He, and I'll quote him, I have heard that women are overlooked, talked over by men, whether it is in boardrooms, in meeting rooms, in staff rooms, in media conferences, in cabinets or anywhere else. I have heard about being marginalised, women being intimidated, women being belittled, women being diminished and women being objectified. Well, the former Liberal backbencher, Ms Banks, is on the record as describing Mr Morrison as menacing. Perhaps the PM would have been less surprised if he took the time to examine how he and his office use power. The Prime Minister has made no secret of his love for the top job. He makes no secret of his love for red carpets or for power. But being powerful comes with obligations and responsibilities. You should be honest. And you should exercise power in a way that enhances, not diminishes others. Now, we've heard from those opposite that none of this is a big deal, that crossing the floor is a very important freedom for the Liberal Party. And indeed, when five senators voted for the One Nation private senators bill last Monday, Mr Morrison said that he doesn't run an autocracy. But if that's the case, where are the moderate Liberals crossing the floor for strong climate action? Where is the member for Wentworth or the member for North Sydney? Where is Senator Hume? Where are the others? Because it turns out that having the courage of your convictions requires both courage and conviction. So here we are entering the ninth year, the ninth year of this tired government. And in yet another occasion, the Prime Minister's inability to understand the way that women experience work and experience public life is on display. We have a leave pass for members who cross the floor and call for civil disobedience, and we have a dressing down for members who want an integrity commission. As I said, it's sometimes the things that someone doesn't do that tell you as much about their character as the things that they do do. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. There were lots of debating points in that, uh, in that contribution to, uh, to be responded to. Um, can I draw particular reference to uh, Minister Birmingham and his response to the question? And I think it was an important point he made, and it's something which all of us on this side of the chamber hold dear. And that is, in the Liberal Party of Australia, we have the right. We have the right, and indeed, there's an expectation. There's an ex expectation from some of our members that we will exercise that right from time to time when we consider it necessary when we consider it necessary to cross the floor on matters of great principle, of great conviction and of conscience. And the member for Bass, uh, Bridget Archer MP, exercised that right last week. And that is her right in the Liberal Party. And I want to quote from the article that appeared in The Guardian on 24 November 2021 in relation to Ms Archer MP, member for Bass, exercising that, this, that right. And I want to quote from her, and this is what she said, Deputy President. She said, quote, to be perfectly clear, I always reserve my right to cross the floor. That is one of the reasons I sit on this side in the Liberal Party, end quote. That is one of the reasons I sit on this side in the Liberal Party, end quote. So Bridget Archer, when she made her decision as the member for Bass, which party she would represent, one of the core, one of the core principles of the Liberal Party of Australia had direct relevance to her decision to join the Liberal Party of Australia. And that was her right, her right as every single member of the Liberal Party in the lower house and every Liberal senator in the upper house has, and, and members of the National Party similarly, to cross the floor, to cross the floor on matters of deep conviction and on matters of conscience, if, if they believe that is what they need to do in order to represent their constituencies and to act in accordance with their principles. And that's what Miss Archer did, the member for Bass, last week. And I deeply, deeply respect her for making that decision. And we also, we also heard from our Prime Minister in relation to that decision that our party is not a party of drones. 
It's not a party of drones. There are strong personalities, strong-minded individuals in our party. And we've seen that demonstrated in the two and a half years which I've been sitting in this place. And I'm sure we'll see it continue to be demonstrated in the future. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing for our democracy. I think that's a good thing for our democracy. In relation to the particular matter which Ms Archer, member for Bass, crossed the floor on in terms of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, it is an important matter, and I certainly am 100 per cent behind the introduction of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Do I support the independent member's bill? No, because, because I am deeply concerned. I am deeply concerned with respect to the impact of the Commonwealth Integrity Commissioner. Any structure that might be adopted, the impact any structure could be adopted upon persons who are subjects to complaints. And I want to bring, and I've done this in the past, and I want to bring to the chamber uh, its attention to the matter of Mr Stephen Pearce, who went through who went through the New South Wales ICAC process. Now, Mr Pearce was Deputy Commissioner of State Emergency Services. He went through an ordeal, an absolute ordeal, through New South Wales ICAC. And I quote from an article by Natalie O'Brien in the Sydney Morning Herald, dated 13 February 2016. And this is to quote Mr Stephen Pearce, who was subject to the ICAC procedures in New South Wales. I quote, my family and I suffered substantial public humiliation, emotional and financial trauma, he said. Never did the system, never did the system offer me uh, the support I needed and I was crucified publicly and professionally. I was crucified publicly and professionally. That's from Mr Stephen Pearce, who was subject to ICAC's procedures in relation to any corruption in the New South Wales jurisdiction. These are important issues. These are important issues. And Ms Archer, the member for Bass, was quite entitled to cross the floor and deeply respected for doing so. At the same time, I will say to this chamber that I will do all I can to make sure that any Commonwealth Integrity Commission gets the balance right, gets the balance right in terms of pursuing matters which ought to be pursued by a corruption commission, but also ensuring that op reputations are not unnecessarily trashed and that the legacy lasts forever, even though the political caravan moves Thank you, on. Thank Senator Scar. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Scar is right. There's a lot of different debating points you can make about what happened in question time today in response to Senator McAllister's questions and others' questions. But I don't think the point here is about crossing the floor. I think the point here is about what happens when a woman, in particular, does something the Prime Minister doesn't want her to do, and what the impact is on that woman, and what that says about that Prime Minister's beliefs and values and the culture of this government. And I am deeply unenthusiastic about contributing to this debate, because in my two and a half years in the Senate, this issue has dominated so much of the public discourse. This government's complete ineptitude at listening to women, at understanding the issues that women are raising, at seeing this place as a workplace where not only people have rights, but we have responsibilities to one another and to each other. And for women in this workplace especially, that is abused. Now, I was in this chamber only two weeks when I first heard the phrase quota girls thrown out from those opposite me. A few weeks. What a, what, a, what a nice welcome to the chamber which has parity of gender. And in the years since, we've seen three different positions on quotas from the Prime Minister. We've had views expressed like, you know, we, we want more women in, but just not at the expense of men. We've seen all sorts of incidents when it comes to the treatment of female MPs in this government, whether it's Miss Archer, as was the, the topic in question time today, but also uh, for Julia Banks, Ms Banks, and her experience in this parliament. We've seen the, the 
kind of nonsense the Prime Minister's uttered to concerns of women giving birth in regional New South Wales, saying, well, the, the solution to your lack of access to maternity care isn't a hospital, it's a highway. We've seen this government sit on the Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report for almost a year and then completely fudge their response to the recommendations, pretend they were going to do it all and renege on that commitment. But all of this pales in comparison to the way that female staff have been treated in this building. And it pales in comparison to the way women in general are treated by this government. When women join the lawns of Parliament House to march for justice and the Prime Minister says women in Australia should be grateful because not far from here such marches even now are being met with bullets. I am just so sick of having these debates. I am so appalled that this has to be a topic in question time. It has to be because it's still going on, right? It has to be because we're still seeing this kind of behaviour. But in my two and a half years here, given everything I've seen and everything this place has borne witness to, given the courage and bravery of women seeking to change the culture of this place, I'm just completely fed up that not enough seems to happen to recognise that this is a workplace, to recognise that the people within this workplace need to be treated with respect. And if women in this workplace feel like that, well, is it any wonder that women outside of this workplace looking in, first of all, don't want to put their hand up to be here, and that's especially true on the other side? Is it any wonder? But also, is it any wonder that those women don't feel like their concerns, that the issues facing them aren't being listened to or heeded to by this government? Because this is a cultural thing and it starts at the top. If this is the way Prime Minister perceives women, if this is the way the Prime Minister responds to concerns from women, is this, if this is the way that the Prime Minister runs his workplace, which is all of our workplace, then that culture is going to permeate down and it doesn't just stay in this building. It goes beyond its walls as well. And it sets a standard which then becomes the standard more broadly in the public. And it is no wonder that women in Australia are fed up. I am fed up too. So I just urge as we look at the debating points, as we continue this debate, we just give some consideration to how serious this is for the women outside of this building and those within it. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Madam Deputy President, um, look, I'm fed up with, mis with being mischaracterised by Labor in relation to these matters. What we are seeing right now is a grubby campaign to denigrate the Prime Minister. We have an inherent right in the Liberal and National parties to cross the floor. You didn't happen to mention through you Deputy President, senators have not men mentioned Senator Fevranti Wells or Senator McMahon, who crossed the floor. Don't they matter? So, what we are seeing here is a continuing grubby attempt by the Labor Party to denigrate the campaign and to rewrite history. Because the fact of the matter is that our government has done more for Australian w women than any other government before. And when I talk about what we are doing for Australian women, I talk about the in excess of $1 billion that we are providing for women's safety, matters such as emergency accommodation. Did, did members officers, did the former Labor federal government ever make a provision for women fleeing family violence? Did the former Labor government ever think that it might be a good idea to provide support in emergency situations when women are fleeing family violence through finance for emergency accommodation? We have provided an absolute record amount of funding to care for women and children in their hour of need. More flexible parental leave 
accessible, affordable childcare, not childcare for millionaires, which is Labor's policy. That's what Labor's policy is. More money going to millionaires than ever before. Our government is providing childcare to those who need it the most, those who are in the lower and medium income brackets. And it is actually a disgrace, Labor's childcare policy. And look at our record on closing the gender pay gap. Uh, it is, was at a record low under us of 13.4 per cent, now sits at 14.2 per cent, down from 17.4 per cent under the previous Labor government. So when we talk about caring for women, this is one of the most caring workplaces I have ever worked in. I can tell you right now, and I've put that on the record before, but I will call out bad behaviour, and I have, as I did with a member for Higgins on Insiders earlier this year in relation to Dr Lamming. But where were Labor women when Emma Hussar was treated so disgracefully, when Labor had made a decision to get rid of her? Where were Labor women? She was subjected to the most horrific abuse, false allegations. It drove her almost to a nervous breakdown, to breaking point. Where were Labor women in standing up for Emma Hussar? Where were they in standing up for Gray, uh, Gay Brodman, the former member for, for Canberra? There is so much hypocrisy because when it comes to bad behaviour from Labor, I have not seen Labor women stand up and hold those to account who treat Labor women so badly. And as for our respect at work report, let me put on the record that nearly all of the recommendations have been implemented by our government. There are some, of course, that can only be implemented by the states and territories, so I correct the record in that respect. We are really proud of the work that we are doing, and I say to the member for Bass, who has got courage, but what a wonderful party we are in where we celebrate the fact that we can exercise our conscience. And guess what happens to Labor senators and members if they cross the floor, if they exercise their conscience? They are expelled. They are the rules of Labor. There is no ability to stand up for what's right or exercise one's own conscience in the Labor Party. You cross the floor and you are gone. So let's stop the hypocrisy that we are hearing from Labor in this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Well, let's just be really clear. This issue is not about crossing the floor. It is about respect for women, about equal treatment for women, not just care, but respect. We can debate the policy in this place about various positions on either side of the chamber. But the core disrespect for women shown by the Prime Minister is the issue that we are discussing right now. This issue is about the appalling double standards applied by this Prime Minister when it comes to the way he treats the men of his government and the way he treats the women of his government. Tasmanian Liberal Bridget Archer, the member for Braddon, was singled out not for having the audacity to stand with the opposition and the crossbenchers and the Australian people in calling for a National Integrity Commission, but for being a woman. Thank you. She was marched over to the PM's office against her wishes. The response to other members of the government, wayward South Australian Senator Alex Antic, crossed the floor to vote to undermine public health messages. Was he marched immediately over to the PM's office? No. Apparently, according to the PM, Senator Antic was just expressing his right to be an individual. It's the same with the two Queensland renegades, Senator Gerard Rennick and the member for Dawson, George Christensen, who both crossed the floor to vote with One Nation to undermine the hard work of health officials. Were they immediately marched directly to the PM's office? No. No, they were not. By our own admission, Bridget Archer had asked on numerous occasions to have the conversation postponed, not cancelled, 
postponed until she was able to gather her thoughts. She knew she had to talk to him, but she clearly needed some time to collect herself. And this simple request was denied. Her wishes were ignored. Now, former Liberal MP Julia Banks has previously called out this exact type of behaviour, calling it menacing, bullying and calculating. And Grace Tame has labelled this treatment as textbook coercive control. So now we add Bridget Archer to the list of recent displays of blatant disrespect. Grace Tame, Brittany Higgins, Julia Banks, Christine Holgate, Sam Maiden, the women of the March for Justice. What we are seeing over and over again is regardless of the situation, the PM has consistently refused to respect women's views, refused to respect women's voices, and refused to respect women's request. This pattern of behaviour, this culture within our current government is appalling. And that is what we stand up against here today. That behaviour, disrespecting women, disrespecting the women across Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response given by Senator Payne to my questions on the TRIPS waiver and vaccine equity. History will look poorly on Australia and other wealthy countries for their complete and utter failure to support low-income countries in getting vaccinated. This is a complete abrogation of our responsibility to other countries, many of whom already suffer because of the colonial legacies that have left them in poverty. The global COVID crisis continues to evolve, but Australia is missing in action when it comes to strong support for global vaccine equity. Vaccine apartheid looms large amongst the landscape of global inequities. What we are seeing on an international level is rich, high-income nations making strides towards vaccinations while poorer nations are left behind. Omicron should put further pressure on wealthy countries like Australia to step up, fund and facilitate vaccination across the world. This is the time to show global sol solidarity, but we are not quite there. It has been over a year since India and South Africa first brought a proposal to the World Trade Organization to waive intellectual property provisions on COVID-19 vaccines and allow for mass vaccine production across the global south. This was a simple and incredibly reasonable request. And if it were agreed to at the time, would have already allowed for the delivery of millions of vaccines to people in countries that have really struggled to gain access to jabs in the quantities needed to keep their populations safe. Dozens of low-income countries were quick to join on and support the proposal from India and South Africa. The United States eventually followed then finally, in September of this year, Australia announced that it would support a waiver. But Australia has since clarified its position, with DFAT telling estimates last month that the government has decided that rather than attaching itself to a specific proposal, it's going to focus its efforts on encouraging the key players to find convergence and to encourage both sides to show flexibility with a view to ensuring that we have a consensus outcome. Well, that's not good enough. In fact, it's pretty shameful. This sort of hedging is simply terrible. It's the coward's way out. And now countries across the world are paying the price. The emergence of the Omicron variant has put further pressure on Australia to co-sponsor the intellectual property waiver. At its upcoming ministerial meetings, the World Trade Organization will consider the intellectual property waiver first proposed by India and South Africa more than one year ago. Australia is at the table and we should declare our hand unambiguously in support of the waiver proposal from India and South Africa. In fact, we should go further and do everything we can to galvanize support for this waiver. 
The depressing reality is that by refusing to co-sponsor the waiver, Australia has taken the side of big pharmaceutical companies over the health and well-being of millions of people. It's time for Australia to give its full-throated support to the waiver proposed by India and South Africa. In addition, Australia should substantially boost funding to the COVAX vaccine facility to ramp up vaccination in low-income countries. Our per capita contributions at this point have been miserly. Australia's donor funding to the global COVAX facility is low by global standards. Australia is contributing only about $4 per person compared to nearly triple that by the United States and many times less than countries <clears throat> such as Sweden and Norway. Last month, WHO reported that just five African countries, less than 10% of Africa's 54 nations are projected to hit their 2021 target of fully vaccinating 40% of their populations unless efforts to accelerate the pace take off. The question we have to ask is how many more people have to unnecessarily get sick or die from COVID in the global south before Australia backs the TRIPS waiver and properly funds COVAX so that global vaccine equity can become a reality. Thank you, Senator Fruki. So the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Fruki to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we now move.